What's up, home team? Episode 2, Jamie's Day Off Podcast, coming to you live from Lubbock, Texas. Let's get right into it. All right, let's talk about today. Uh, today has been a hot fucking day. I don't know if you've been outside uh, since the sun's been up. Uh, you know, maybe you work in the nighttime. Maybe you work overnight. You've been sleeping during the daytime. You ain't been outside. Maybe you didn't know. It's fucking hot. Uh, right now, my computer says 99 degrees Fahrenheit. I was in the car earlier, the motherfucker said 101, uh, so it is hot outside. I'll tell you what, it's never been a better time uh, to be in the HVAC uh, profession, you know what I'm saying, working on keeping people's air conditioners running, and uh, you know, even being a mechanic as far as cars go, keeping people's ACs running, because uh, you're going to fucking need it. I'll tell you what, it's never been a better time to be in that profession. Everybody needs an AC because everybody gets hot, everybody complains about being hot, uh, it's been a hot fucking day today. I'll tell you what. And and speaking of uh, HVAC's uh, profession and mechanics as far as air conditioning goes, you know it's fucking hundred degrees uh, anyway. You slice it here in here in Lubbock, Texas. So imagine what it's like. Uh, you know, uh, in in Florida, in California, uh, anywhere up and down the east or the west coast, even down in the Texas coast, the third coast. How fucking hot and humid it might be, you know what I'm saying? Living right next to the beach, boy. Right next to the beach. Imagine how fucking hot and humid it would be. So, you know, anybody who who wants to live in one of those uh, places, shit, if you can't handle it being hot here in Texas where there is no, with very little humidity, I won't say there's no humidity, but where there's very little humidity and it's just hot, imagine being somewhere where it's hot and humid, you know what I'm saying? So... Keep that in mind when you're complaining about the weather here in, in Texas where you only got one or the other. Except for when it rains, that's when the humidity comes out. Uh, that's when it comes into play here in Texas. So, it's a hot fucking day is my point. Um, I was out and about earlier today. Uh, I had an interview. Um, I, I was, I'm trying to use my CDL, uh, you know, my truck driving license, trying to get a job uh, in that field. And uh, I had an interview today with a pretty high, um, not high, but a pretty big organization, a pretty big company that does worldwide business uh, all over the world, worldwide, you know what I'm saying? Uh, pretty big company. So uh, one of the companies that I've been hoping to get on with, uh, just because I, I know a lot about them, being that I know somebody who works for this company, and you know they're always telling me, um, you know, the perks and, and all the good stuff that there is working for this company, uh, as well as, um, you know, the, the benefits and, and the high pay that CDL offers. Uh, I've, I've been trying to get into this company for for a couple of years now. So uh, I had an interview today with them. Uh, it's my second interview uh, since uh, my first interview. <laughs> Stupid. So I had my, my second interview with them today, and... Um, you know, I, I feel like it went well, but how, how you just never know these things, you know, when it comes to interviews. Um, I never really realized how, uh, how much, uh, fuck, I don't even know how to say it uh, correctly. Um, how much on both, on, on their, on the interviewers and what they, the questions that they ask, what the reasoning is behind certain questions. Uh, I never really realized what what all went into the questions that they ask. I just thought it was they just want you to answer the questions so they can gauge, you know, more or less what type of person you are. But I feel I I've come to learn that it goes deeper than that, you know, like, and you know, as well as that, the the whole application process. Like now they have these uh, questionnaires where it's you know it, it asks you on a scale of one to I, this this for this particular company. Uh, it was asking you questions and asking you to rate yourself on a, on a scale of one to five. You know, what best describes you in terms of the situation, you know, the question that it asks. So, like, uh, and some of them were fucking tricky. I don't, I don't remember 100% completely, but, you know, something along the lines like uh, how, you know, what would you skip certain procedures to help you help you finish uh, work on time or ahead of schedule, how likely are you to do that? Um, having to deal with difficult customers, how would you rate your ability to deal with those 
type of situations on a scale of one to ten? Are you a hard worker on a scale of one, or fucking ten? I said five. On a scale of one to five, uh, Walmart does the same thing. They ask you like, and and those aren't those seem like pretty straightforward questions. I can't remember in detail the exact questions where it's it's like a tricky fucking question. So it's like it's asking you to be truthful, but. I guess it's not fucking... It's, I shouldn't have even brought it up if I can't go into detail about it. But there's some fucking tricky questions in terms of these interviews. Um, where I guess you don't have to necessarily have to lie. But you can't tell the truth either. So you gotta fucking... You gotta know the wording behind some of these questions. Uh, and answer uh, how you feel they want you to answer. You can't necessarily answer how you are 100%. So very tricky shit in these big big company interviews and 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 this is just um that's just these type of jobs cdl jobs uh like i said walmart had the same thing not necessarily like restaurant or uh any type of entry-level job like that they don't have those fucking kind of questions but anything above that uh they they have those weird questions so i can't imagine what it would be like for a uh you know a bank job or a, a, a management job to manage a fucking bank or, or some big firm, um, even one of these big organizations like I like I interviewed for today. I can't imagine what the questions are for that level, for the next next level type of uh, employment that you're trying to fucking get into. So yeah, it's some tricky shit that goes into these interviews. And today surely was, uh, it was tricky, uh, but you know, like I feel like I did, I feel like I did pretty well, all things considered, especially if you know me. Uh, you know, you know what I look like, you know what I'm saying, I'm a short guy, uh, I weigh fucking 110 pounds soaking wet, I'm not a big guy, and the people in this, uh, field of work, CDL jobs, are big, bigger cats, you know what I'm saying, like, I, I, I'm five, six, if I wear some fat shoes, some fat bottom shoes, you know what I'm saying, so I'm short, I don't weigh a whole lot, uh, I'm not, a, I'm not a, uh, um, I'm not an imposing specimen. I'm not a big guy. You know what I'm saying? So the guys in this profession are fucking 5'8", 5'10", pushing 6 feet, over 200 fucking pounds. You know, solid guys. So I, you know, I go in there to interview for these for this place. And then, you know, I feel like I have to, to overly prove myself in these type of positions to to match what they output or even exceed, exceed that. So I got to work twice as hard to get the job minimally done and then push further than that to exceed and i you know a good thing about that is that naturally i've developed this uh natural ability this natural ability to work hard and work harder than most people uh and i i feel like i do do that so ask you know, anybody that I work with in my current job i work fucking hard bro and it's not like one of those physically demanding jobs but it's one of those jobs where you definitely got to keep moving. And I feel like in this job that I interviewed for today, I, I, I tried to get that point across is that I am a, I'm a hard fucking worker. Oh, pardon me. Fucking yawning. Apologies. Um, so like, you know, and then they ask, you know, questions. Uh, the, the big question that I, I, I feel like I answered pretty well. Uh, well two of them. Uh, and I, I, I did some, some, uh, I guess research, and then I did some some studying on how to answer these questions. So I feel like I was a, a bit more prepared. But one of them being the first one was, uh, where do you see yourself in five years if you're hired onto this company? And uh, you know, while I was in the lobby waiting to be interviewed, I, they they have this video playing in the lobby uh, about the work culture, the organization, um, how they recognize their employees, and you know some of the employees that stand out. They win these best of the best awards. So, you know, I feel like, you know, thankfully I was paying attention enough to watch this, to be watching this video while I was waiting to be interviewed because I showed up 30 fucking minutes early. I wanted to leave a good impression. You know, this guy showed up early and he was, he was better than good. He was better than decently prepared um, when he answered this question. That's the impression I wanted to leave. Sure enough, I felt like I did that because I was looking at this video and, you know, you see these people being recognized for doing an outstanding job in their, um, in their, um, position they receive these big ass fucking trophies um that say you know that that uh it's the best of the best awards and i said you know i see myself you know coming in providing value 
and uh, five years down the line in that time frame, becoming, you know, receiving one of these awards, uh, becoming one of the best of the best, not just some fucking cookie cutter, cookie cutter answer. Um, I see myself coming in, working hard, showing up every day, doing a good job. Um, you know, cookie cutter shit like that. You know, making money, and you know, becoming a, um, you know, a standout employee. I, I, I tried to go above that and show that I was paying attention to their work culture and how they recognize their employees. So I said I, be, I want to become one of the best of the best in my position and overall through this company. So that was the first one. And then the second one, uh, and I, I was very surprised that I did get this question because uh, at my, the job that I'm in right now, I didn't get asked this question. Uh, but uh, the job I interviewed, how they closed the interview was, do you have any questions for us? Or the guy said, for me. Uh, or maybe he said for us. I don't fucking remember. Um, he said, uh, yeah, he said, uh, do you have any questions for me? So I was I, I, I was doing my research on YouTube, how to answer this type of question, because, na- you know, in, in, in jobs that require a little bit more skill than your entry-level jobs, and, and including the job that I'm in right now, is um, I was trying to, you know, do my research to answer that question as best as I could to leave a lasting impression. And I said, um, what skills, what are some top skills for this position that you would think uh would lead me to become a successful what skills do you find necessary to be successful in this position that i'm interviewing for and sure enough man like uh he said you know you gotta have good time management i think that was the biggest one that he said was that you have to have good time management and then you know before they answered that question before they asked that question and in the middle between from when they asked me the first question about the five years uh, they ask you for your strengths and weaknesses and situation type questions and stuff like that. And I told them, you know, one of my biggest qualities was that um, I utilize good time management. And um, that was one of the skills that he said was necessary to be successful uh, in the role that I was applying for. So I feel like since I, I, went, I said that prior in the interview, uh, it came back at the end when he answered the question when I asked him. Uh, you know, what skills are necessary. He said the biggest one was time management. So I feel like I did pretty well. Um, I don't think anybody else is going to answer that question. Uh, I don't think anybody's going to answer that that question of, do you have any questions for us type answer. I don't feel like anybody's going to do that. I feel like it's just like, no, you, you pretty much, you went over. And I've, I've, I've been guilty of answering that question like that. No, you went over everything in the interview process uh, that I, you know, that I would need to know. Uh, I'm good to go. And I didn't say that this one. I, you know, I said, what skills do I need to be successful in this role? So I feel like overall it went pretty good. On a scale of 1 to 10, I'd probably say like a strong 7, 5. Um, I feel like I did pretty well. So fingers crossed. Hopefully I get this job because, I mean, uh, I make good money where I'm at. I make really good money in the position that I'm in. And I've gone from, uh, you know, I started at 950. I started below what they start cats at now. I started below that, and then I've worked my way up to making uh, as much, if not more, than the people that have been there since this place is opened, and half the time. So I make good money, and I get paid every week, and it's cash tips and stuff like that. So I make good, 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 good money. But I want to, I want to take my my working skills, my skill sets to the next level, and take on a more serious role uh, in terms, and, and that being. Uh, driving a fucking 18 wheeler, you know what I'm saying? Eastbound and down, baby. Eastbound and down. Load them up and truck them. Uh, Smoking the Bandit. So you know, I, I want to take it to the next level. So hopefully, I get that fucking. Hopefully, they. I hear something. They said I should hear something by Tuesday. Today's fucking. What the fuck is today? Today is Tuesday. Yeah, today is Tuesday. So hopefully by next Tuesday, they said I should know something. They got more interviews to do. Uh, but I should hope to, I should expect to hear something by next Tuesday, yes or no, in terms of yes or no, so fingers crossed everybody. Um, another thing, you know, as it pertains to this, uh, CDO work, uh, this is a bit of a rant, uh, is when you, when you get your CDO, a lot of places that you apply to, like, even locally, a lot of the, even, even over the road, because as you either go locally or you go over the road, and a lot of places require you to have six months to a year's worth of experience all the way up to two years uh depending how um established and 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 good a reputation that some of these companies have is they expect you to have that much experience but 
how do you how the fuck do they expect uh, they know something that I don't know and I need to break it down and figure it out um, but I've never figured been able to figure it out since I've had my CDL and I've had it for two years is that how do you how do they expect you to get this type of experience if they're not willing to give you an opportunity to gain said experience and what I found is that uh, it, you know the places that I've applied to locally you know I've applied to uh, you know major distribution chains uh, garbage garbage uh, disposal companies, you know, driving big-ass uh, garbage trucks, uh, city of Lubbock, um, driving positions, co- um, construction uh, companies, um, is that they, they require this experience. And uh, one of the ways that they that you can get go about getting this experience that I found out when I was in truck driving school is that you can go over the road, which which doesn't make any fucking sense to me. You want me to drive an 18-wheeler all over the fucking country in places that I've never been to. You want me to navigate the open road and and interstates, highways, city streets, these cities that I've never been to, to gain this experience, to then come back to drive in a city where I live or am familiar with. You want me to do that for six months to a year up to two years before I can come back and apply for your fucking position that's that's the weirdest fucking thing that I that's one of the biggest problems that I have it's the biggest conundrum that I cannot figure out why that is the case that's it's so weird you want me to fucking navigate the the fucking unknowns you want me to navigate the fucking unknowns before I can navigate the known? I have a better... Ch- I know my way around these fucking streets like the back of my fucking hand. You know what I'm saying? And you want me to go out there and navigate some shit I've never been to before I can come by. Before I can come back and, and apply to your job. So fucking weird. Uh, you know, but I digress. Hopefully I, I, I left a good impression with this interview that I had today. Hopefully I'll hear something back. Um... What else about today? Oh, also, I'm going to tell you, like, this has nothing to do with truck driving, but uh, if you have kids or if you don't have kids, uh, you know, one of my biggest, uh, one of the things that I enjoy the most about my day is, uh, and hear me out because it sounds bad at first, is dropping my kids off at school. I love dropping my, I didn't drop them off today, I will say that, my wife did. I I stayed up late last night and, uh, I didn't. I didn't wake up in time to take my kids to school, so my wife did. But normally, I'm the morning person, and I take my kids to school. But I, I, I love taking my kids to school because you know they wake up, they're not necessarily you know looking forward to going to school. Which, um, as time progresses and they get back into the routine of school, because they've only been in there for three days. Today's the fourth day back in school, but the more they get into school, and this has happened in years prior, that, you know, they actually look forward to going to school, you know, seeing their friends and, and doing school activities, but, uh, they're, they're not at that point yet, um, a little bit, but not, not that much, but taking them to school, uh, you see how innocent these kids are, man, and then other people's kids as well, and you see all the, the, you know, the, the enjoyment in, in other parents' faces when they take their kids to school, I, I really enjoy sending my kids, um, with the values that we've taught them, you know, being, you know, uh, do good in school, you know, be nice to everybody, uh, use your good judgment type stuff. Uh, you feel like you're preparing these kids enough for how old they are to, to take on the day, to take on school. And, uh, you know, when I say bye to my kids, hugs and kisses and stuff like that, it's a warm feeling. It's an enjoy. It's an, it's, an, it's a feeling that I enjoy. Uh, every day that I take them to school so if you have kids or you don't have kids uh you know you owe it to yourself don't jump into having kids uh that's not what I'm saying but you know it's you you, there's a lot of feelings that come with having kids and sending them off to the world but this is one of those more enjoyable feelings man it it, it warms my heart seeing my kids go to school and then uh my kids do pretty well in school they get good grades um you know they are they're they're young still uh, they're in elementary school, but nonetheless, like, you know, a lot of kids have trouble, you know, with school and being interested in school. They just want to have fun and, and do kid things, which I've, I totally understand. I was there. We were all there at one point. We just want to do kid fucking things. Uh, but they, you know, they go to school and they work hard when they're in school. So it's it's an enjoyable feeling sending them, knowing that they're going to do a good job and, uh, 
you know, when you pick them up after school, you hear about how, how well their day went and, uh, you know, what they enjoyed about school. So, um, that's my side note about kids is, um, it's an enjoyable feeling. It's a good way to start your day, seeing your kids, uh, go to school. Now, with, uh, today, uh, today, you know, that like, like I said, it's all the notable things that I've done today. Uh, and it's only 2.50, uh, and I've been awake since 9 o'clock. So, those are the only things that have happened between then and now, uh, with those being said, let's go ahead and talk about last week. So, last week, uh, you may have put in 47 hours at work, uh, 7 hours overtime, uh, and um, I was only scheduled for 34, right? Mind you that. But somebody got hurt at work, so I had to come in and, and, and help out, which I don't mind doing. I'm a team player. But Saturday fucking, I, I clocked into work on Saturday morning at 12.30 in the p.m., the afternoons, you know what I'm saying, and I worked a total of 15 fucking hours, um, all the way till 3.30 in the morning, so 12 p.m. to 3 in the morning, man, 15 long fucking hours, and what I do, I'm going constantly, I'm doing something at work constantly, it's one of our busier days, and with it being, um, NFL preseason, uh, there's plenty to do, and sure enough, that was the case Saturday. Uh, it started off a little bit slower, but towards the, the evening hours, uh, we had the Dallas Cowboys playing again, uh, which we'll get into in a little in a second. And then we had the uh, UFC uh, 305, Drakus Duplessis uh, versus Israel Adesanya, if you're, if you're familiar with uh, UFC. So real quick, we, I, it, it, was a long, it was a long day slash night. And then, you know, mind you that, I fucking closed, we closed, uh, we get out of there at, at 3.30 in the morning, and I clocked in the next morning at 10 a.m. So, you know, fucking four hours and change, I came home and took a nap, a little power nap, quote unquote, and then I clocked in and I worked another fucking 10 hours uh, that Sunday to close out the fucking pay period, 47 fucking hours. Now, uh, it, it's it, it was a long fucking Long week, long weekend, Saturday and Sunday, but I will tell you one of the good things about working where I work is that we do show, it's a sports bar. I won't tell you which one. I'm not going to say no names, but it's a sports bar of sorts. And uh, we show the UFC fights. We show we show, we show the UFC fights, the pay-per-views, the major boxing fights, and, you know, football games. And uh, the good thing about Saturday was that I was able to watch uh, some of the preseason games, and then I was able to watch the, the UFC fights. So... Uh, you know, that's, that was one of the good, that's one of the good things about where I work that I enjoy about it. And, uh, you know, you know, speaking of UFC, we're going to, we'll talk about the, the, the main event recap. And it was a, it was a fucking good fight. I, I'm, I, I, I bet one of the guys at work, you know, we, we bet on the main event and sure enough, I won and it was, uh, I'm $5 richer. I will just tell you that about it. $5 to my net fucking worth. And, um, it, it was a good fight, man. Israel Adesanya came out and he was landing some good shit. He was, you know, uh, landing some good body kicks, some good body shots, uh, putting his striking together really well. And uh, uh, I'm just going to say DDP. Drake is two places. Uh, I'm not going to say his whole fucking name every time because I'm going to butcher it if I haven't already. But he was, you know, he kept swinging. He kept coming. He was uh, working the takedowns. He, was, he, he had a submission attempt in the uh, first or second round. Uh, rear naked, so you could tell he was trying to work his submission, his wrestling and his submissions on Adesanya, who's more so, more so of a striker. And uh, you know, it was back and forth uh, all the way up until the fourth round, and it looked like DDP was was fading. He looked, he he had some more, he had some wear and tear on his face too, mind you that. So it, it looked like Adesanya, he was definitely getting the better of the striking, but DDP kept coming. And fourth round, he kept, uh, you know, pressing pressing the striking on Adesanya. And eventually, you know, he landed a few shots. Adesanya turned his back, and he was kind of trying to get away from the strikes, but he had his back turned to DDP. So as he was doing that, you know, he landed a couple more fucking shots to his face, and he ended up tripping Adesanya up and getting on his back, securing the choke, and he wins by rear naked choke in the fourth round. So it was a great fucking fight. And any time I bet on sports, obviously... I want the, the the game or the fight to be fucking a good one at least. Even if if I do lose, I want it to be good at least. And sure enough, it was a great fucking fight. And not only was it a great fight, I fucking won five dollars, and I'm five dollars richer. So we're all going out for a steak, all right? Steaks on me. So that was that was one of the good. That was one of the highlights of Saturday night. Also, and like I said, I'm not a, I'm not a cowboy fan. 
but I, I give credit where it is due. And the Cowboys came away with another win and put up 27 points. Uh, they're, they're a rookie quarter, not even rookie. Um, he's been in the league for a couple of years now, coming from San Francisco. But he was, he's a backup um, to Dak Prescott. And uh, Trevor Lance, he comes in, he looks good. He's got a rushing touchdown, he's got a passing touchdown. And uh, he was doing good work, you know, all the way around uh, throughout that game. Like I said, they put up 27 points. And um, the the kicker for the Cowboys, and like I said, I don't know everybody, but I, I know he's a kicker because he's the one that kicked the fucking field goal. Uh, ties for the longest field goal uh, in NFL history at 66 yards. Mind you, it was preseason. People are going to be like, it doesn't count because it was preseason, and the guy that originally has the record for longest field goal, it happened during the regular season. So, nonetheless, it's in a fucking football game. It, it's It's where people are being competitive. And if, you know, I, I would even go as far to say is that um, preseason football is, is still important. Uh, not in terms of the record, but in terms of the output that these players are putting through because they want to become starters or they want uh, a for sure spot on the team when regular season starts and, and for their career. They want to be uh, they want to be in the game. You know what I'm saying? They want to be contributors. And so, of course, they're going to put forth shit. Second yawn, I do apologize. Fuck, I know that shit's contagious. Uh, but they're going to put forth the effort to 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 make themselves stand out. And, you know, that's why I don't necessarily subscribe to the fact that it was in preseason and not regular season. It's a fucking field goal nonetheless. And you still got to kick 66 yards. 66 yards is a fucking 66 yards any way you slice it. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, the, the distance... 66 doesn't mean any less because it's in fucking preseason. So if you subscribe to that, you can go fuck yourself. You try kicking a 66-yard field goal in the preseason. I bet you you can't do it. I bet you you can't do it. So uh, those are some of the the standouts from that Cowboy game. Um, they could still go fuck themselves. Uh, it's, all, it's uh, you know, Denver Broncos all day on this side. So uh, we'll go over the Broncos win, the recap, also putting up 27 points. Uh, they had a bigger... Um, they won by a bigger margin over the Packers, 27 to two. Although that two is kind of, you know, it's it's not good. A safety is never good. You never want your quarterback to be safety uh, tackled for a safety. Uh, you know, pushing through the defense, getting a safety, and you know, putting up those two points. It looks weird as fuck on the scorecards too, on the scoreboard. Two points, it's not very common. So the fact that you know the Packers put up only two points. That's a good two. Uh, that's a good effort to get that safety and put those two points up. So kudos to the, to the Packers defense. Uh, they sacked Zach Wilson in the end zone uh, for the safety, but uh, nonetheless, uh, and yeah, we'll start with Zach Wilson because he did have a tough time. Uh, he was two for six, uh, like I said, with the safety, but he did have uh, a touchdown as well. He threw for a, touch, a touchdown. So, you know, he had a tough time. He still got on the scoreboard. He didn't complete a whole lot, but, you know, he, he did get on the scoreboard nonetheless. So, Zach Wilson being that he's been in the league, I think not as long as uh, Stidham, but uh, he, he is a tenured uh, quarterback coming from the Jets. Now, he, 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 you know, with that being said, him having a tough time, he still looked decent. And then our, our, our other contributor, like I said, Stidham, he, uh, he was 7 for 11, put up 65 yards and a touchdown, but it was a rushing touchdown, which is impressive nonetheless because how many white boys do you know are running for, running for fucking touchdowns uh, that have the speed and the ability to make moves happen and get into the end zone over, you know, arguably more athletic uh, players uh, that are on defense? You know, how, how often does that happen? So... You, you, you take it when you can get it, and he sure enough, he got it, and we'll get, you know, he gets credit for that. 7 for 11, 65 yards, one rushing touchdown. Now, uh, who, we're, who we're banking on, you know, being that I'm a Broncos fan, we're trying to put all our stock in Bo Nix. And, you know, coming from college, I don't really know a whole lot about him. I don't, I don't pretend to know about where he came from and what where he played, although I should look that up, but I'm not going to stop, stop what I'm doing and, and fucking look it up i don't want you to i don't want to pause the action while i'm in while i've got a groove going so um i know that he comes highly um uh what is the word uh you know we expect a lot from him uh coming from college to the nfl and sure enough he's even even though in preseason like i said cats are out there still trying to take your head off he comes in he looks really fucking good he only misses uh one pass attempt he was eight for nine 80 yards and uh a touchdown 
look fucking really good. Look, look fucking solid against the Packers defense. Uh, they they put up 27 points as a whole. The Broncos, you know, honing it in. Years prior, it, you know, we haven't been the best fucking team. I don't think we finished with a positive record uh, in a couple of seasons. So, you, you know, especially with Russell Wilson, we all thought he was going to perform and, and take us to the Super Bowl ride, Broncos country ride. No, there was none of that, bro. He fucking, fin- they finished with a sorry-ass record. And it might not all be Russell's fault, but we expected a lot from him, and he didn't, you know, he wasn't able to deliver. So... This year it's looking pretty good in terms of preseason output, and you know we're hopeful. I'm hopeful um, that uh, the Broncos finish with a positive record, get to the playoffs, obviously get to the Super Bowl. But it's it's really early uh, to call that. I'm not a Cowboy fan. I'm not going to say this is our fucking year right away. I'm not going to do that. Um, but it's looking good uh, in preseason. I think we got a couple more weeks until. Uh, the regular season starts, and that's when everything really fucking matters. So hopefully he can transition. All these cats can transition uh, as it pertains to the Broncos. I don't give a fuck about anybody else. Uh, I'm not going to ride Mahomes' dick because he came from Texas Tech and he plays with the Chiefs now. I'm not going to do that. I don't ride with the Cowboys um, because they're from Texas, and so am I. I'm not going to do that. I'm riding with the Broncos. So hopefully they these cats can transfer that, this preseason momentum, into the regular season and, and take it as far as we can go. So, that's our preseason um, recap from this weekend. Uh, the main event recap from the UFC 305. And, you know, my hours and output uh, as far as last week goes as well. So, that's last week. Now, let's get into our topics for this week. And and topic number one, and I'm just going to get this out of the way, uh, is, is, is a brief intro about me. I try to keep it as short as possible. It's going to sound long, but, you know, I'm going to keep it as short as possible. I broke this I broke this down uh, to make it a little bit shorter. So, long story short. Uh, right, my name is Jamie. I call myself Jamie the Conqueror, and we'll get into that here, why I do that here in a second. So, I was born in La Mesa, Texas. Uh, I've been back and forth between Lubbock and La Mesa pretty much all my life. Uh, born in La Mesa, moved to Lubbock, moved back to La Mesa, and now I'm back in Lubbock again. So, I've spent... Um, Half of my life in La Mesa, my younger, my younger years, all the way up to my late teens, and uh, like, goddamn, this mic is good. You can hear that truck outside. You hear them move? Oh, he's gone now. Uh, great fucking mic quality. I gotta figure out how to fuck with these uh, settings, uh, you know, to make it so you can't hear that shit. But nonetheless, um, and then I, you know, I spent my younger years all the way up to my teens in La Mesa. I learned a lot of valuable lessons there and then uh, got into a lot of trouble there as well. Uh, after my last stand of trouble, I ended up moving back to Lubbock and I've grown up, uh, you know, all the way up until 31 now. So half my life in La Mesa, half my life in Lubbock. So I got stories about both. But growing up in La Mesa, uh, my dad, uh, he was in the military, so he raised us, um, you know, military style, quote unquote. Uh, he was he was pretty tough on us. Uh, not not overly tough, but he was tough on us, you know what I'm saying, so I grew up, uh, you know, being that he was tough on us, I was obviously scared, you're obviously, all, everybody's m- more times than none scared of their dad just growing up, so I was definitely scared of my dad, my dad uh, had me straight, uh, you know, throughout my upbringing up to a certain point, you know what I'm saying, so much so that I was a square, uh, what I would consider a square, man, I, I didn't have no, no, I didn't, I didn't think about the future, I didn't think about anything other than being a uh, a good kid, a good teenager, or whatever, uh, I was a square, square all the way around, I'm not gonna lie, and then all that leading up till, uh, ninth grade, which is still there in La Mesa, the story still takes place in La Mesa, uh, I met, uh, two of my friends, who are still my friends to this day, uh, two of my best friends, um, I met them, um, in and around ninth grade, um, and that's when, you know, I feel like my life really, I, I, I feel like I, uh, I have the most memories was was starting ninth grade and being that um you you like to experiment in high school sure enough man i was influenced enough to start smoking weed by these cats and uh that's when i feel like i went from a square to you know i guess uh i was influenced a lot uh to to do and to experience other things uh as it pertains to growing up so um I started smoking weed in ninth grade, and um, I I I remember distinctly. I was uh, I had I was you know we were out and about. I was always you know running around the streets, being a hoodlum, doing stuff like that, doing hoodlum stuff in the streets uh, with my friends, smoking weed. And then one day I come home, and I remember um, sitting on my couch, 
and you know, uh, watching TV in my room, trying to uh, isolate myself from my dad so he didn't know that I was high. So I was in my room, I was watching TV, trying to be as normal as possible. And I do remember uh, watching um, Holes um, sometime in middle school. I remember they showed us the movie Holes with Shia LaBeouf, and I, you know, I always liked him and the characters that he played in his uh, movies and whatever, shows, whatever. I didn't watch him as, at the, in the Disney Channel days, none of that shit. But I did see him in Holes, and I took a liking to his acting skills uh, in in the movie Holes. And I remember watching that movie um, one day while I was, you know, in the couch trying to be normal, on the couch trying to be normal, playing off or waiting for my high to wear off so I can, you know, uh, be around my dad. He wouldn't know, right? So I was watching Holes, and uh, I, you know, getting into Shia LaBeouf and his, his acting, uh, skills and, you know, going from holes and then fast forward to when he goes, when he, when he, when he, um, when they made Transformers and he was in, you know, the first couple of Transformers, but the first one I remember watching and, you know, further, um, becoming a fan of his acting skills, uh, more so that I started following his career after that, right? Uh, trying to find out other movies that he was in and upcoming movies that he would, he would later become in. And I remember watching Disturbia, and uh, I think all those were uh, 2007 and below. And I remember uh, 2000, I think it was 2010, um, the movie Wall Street came out. And I had never been uh, into, like, stock trading and Wall Street, none of that type of stuff. But I, like I said, I was a fan of Shia LaBeouf, and this was a more serious role because, like I said, it's on Wall Street. This guy's wearing a suit. He's nicely dressed as opposed to his, like, teenage years, you know, where he plays that type of teenage role. So he goes from being that teenager to a, to a grown man in this Wall Street movie, and, and I, I remember uh, being introduced to uh, Gordon Gecko, who would later play a crucial part in my life. Uh, as it pertains to influences and, and thinking big. Uh, my intro to Gordon Gecko, a.k.a., well, not a.k.a., his name is fucking Michael Douglas. And I don't know if you know Michael Douglas. Um, he, he's he's an old-school actor. The only thing that cats these days would probably know Michael Douglas from is he's uh, Dr. Hank Pym in the Ant-Man movies, the Marvel movies. So that, you know, I was introduced to him in this movie, Wall Street, uh, as Gordon Gecko, And... Uh, you know, going through the whole story of that movie, him being, uh, you know, he goes through his, his, he, he's the father-in-law, he becomes the father-in-law of Shia LaBeouf, um, him and, him and, uh, Michael Douglas's daughter, and Michael Douglas, aka Gordon Gecko, have this, uh, conflict, because he goes to jail at his daughter, in, in his daughter's early age, and they, you know, his daughter has, like, a resentment towards him, so he tries to, he comes out of prison, and he, uh, he tries to get back in his daughter's life, and the way he does that is by um, manipulating his uh, Shia LaBeouf, his, his future son-in-law. And the reason he's trying to get back in his daughter's life is because she has money that he left her before he went to prison that's worth $100 million uh, in, in the time of the movie. So he manipulates Shia LaBeouf, which he also puts on a great fucking performance, but nothing compared to. Uh, and also, uh, Josh Brolin's in that movie, who you know as uh, Thanos in the Marvel movies as well. So he's in that movie, and he's the uh, other conflict, the person that has conflict with Gordon Gecko. They have a whole backstory, which is why um, I ended up watching the first Wall Street, uh, which was released in 1987. You know, that old of a movie, there's no reason why I should probably have an interest in that type of stuff, but I was captivated by the performance of both Josh Brolin and Shia LaBeouf and Michael Douglas in this movie that I, I had to watch the fucking 1987 Wall Street Part 1, which also has Charlie Sheen, who you know from Two and a Half Men, uh, you know, he, he, he was he was great in that fucking show. He was in, you know, some, um, what the fuck is that war movie, um, fuck, I don't remember that movie, uh, it'll come to me later, but. You know, he's been in a lot of stuff, but I knew him from Two and a Half Men, and I like he was funny in that show, so I, you know, I gravitated towards First Wall Street as well because he was the person that had conflict with Michael Douglas in the first part. So there's a whole backstory to that, but, the, you know, getting back to um, the second part, which I saw first, uh, you know, they have conflict. It goes into the to the whole backstory of both of them, and, um, you know, just I was a fan of, of the acting of these cats in these movies, you know, under the, while I was under the influence, you know, while I was smoking uh, marijuana, I'm not gonna say just smoking. I don't want you. To, I don't want to leave that to the imagination. Well, what were you smoking? Meth, crack? What was it? It was weed. Okay, so I was, you know, under the influence, and I would watch these movies, and I would just become a fact, uh, an act. 
I would become a fan of the acting uh, as an art. I, I feel like I had a, more of an appreciation for the acting. And I didn't want to become an actor. No, I was influenced to make uh, big moves and, you know, have a lot of money later on in life, which I'm still working on, which we'll get to. But, you know, the acting and some of the quotes in these in these movies, you know, it just it, it fucking hit, man. It left a lasting impression on me. Uh, you know, fucking uh, Josh Brolin, who plays... Um, uh, Bretton James in this fucking in this movie I'll just give you some quotes and you gotta fucking see this movie for it to to hit home man he says uh, Zabel once knew how to run money dying because of it was his choice as far as I'm concerned it's just money but when you don't know what you're doing it's fatal Mr. Moore not knowing what you're doing fucking cold fucking scene cold quote you gotta see the scene you gotta watch the movie so you know what it means and um you know, like I said, he has conflict with uh, Gordon Gecko in the movie, uh, Michael Douglas, and it goes over the backstory that Bretton James kind of sold uh, Gordon Gecko out, and that's how he ended up getting more time in prison. Because he, he did go to prison as well for insider trading, uh, but more so because he got backstabbed by this dude named Bretton James. So he comes out, and, um, you know, uh, Gordon Gecko, Michael Douglas, he's trying to work his way back into the Wall Street scene uh, after being in prison for so long and seeing how times have changed. Um, and that, you know, there's, there's all these lies about Gordon Gecko, you know, what he did and why he was in jail and, and how he carries himself like that. And one of the coldest lies, one of the coldest lines that, uh, Gordon Gecko says once he comes across Brandon James for the first time, um, since being out of prison, uh, is that he says, you know, stop telling, you stop telling lies about me and I'll stop telling the truth about you. And that, you know, that quote right there kind of got me into thinking, you know, that there was a backstory, so there must be another part to this movie, and that's how I discovered Wall Street Part 1. That's why I watched Part 1 and, uh, you know, got familiar with it. So saw Part 2, saw Part 1, saw Part 2 again just to get a better understanding of the movie, and now I watch those movies um, every fucking chance that I get. And then, you know, eventually Gordon Gecko works his way back to... He manipulates Shia LaBeouf enough that he gets back into the daughter's life, and they end up signing the money back over to Gordon Gecko, and he, you know, he, he fuck, he fucks them over basically, and he just takes the money, and he, you know, he takes the money, and goes his own way. He, go, he leaves from New York to London, uh, to, to, you know, start back up to get his reputation back and going. And uh, another cold fucking line quote from uh, from Gordon Gecko is, uh, you know, once he gets the money, he starts, you know, getting back into the stock market, uh, into the Wall Street. Um, atmosphere and uh you know he's buying anything and everything during the recession at the time and uh you know he's he's making all the correct moves to put himself back on top and that's what he says he says um what the fuck um where is it where the fuck is it uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. he says you tell him for me babe gordon gecko is back but he says it and he has this aura about him he has this ego to him um he knew what he was doing back in the day. He comes back and he does it again in a new air atmosphere and he says that. I'm like, damn, this motherfucker is cold with it. You know what I'm saying? And it's another reason that inspired me to watch the first part. So, you know, you got to watch that scene. Watch, even just watch the highlights from the movie on YouTube. And uh, there's a lot of fucking great quotes from this from these two movies. And, um, you know, like I said, got back into the first part. Find out that the way that Gordon Gecko makes his way to the top is that he... he he says the most valuable commodity I know of is uh, I know of is information. So he's spying on different uh, investors and deals and stuff like that. So that he and he also says that he doesn't throw darts at a board. He he bids on short things and that's how he does it. He gets insider information, which is part of what gets him in trouble. So um, you know some other fucking cold um, some cold lines to that that inspired me to think big is he says. Uh, you know, if you're not inside, you're outside. And he says, I'm not talking about some $400,000 working Wall Street stiff, flying first class and being comfortable. I'm talking about liquid. He says, $50, $100 million. He says, a player or nothing. And, you know, that's what I want to be. I want to be a standout. You know what I'm saying? So I want to, you know, I want to stand out. I want to set myself apart from anybody who thinks that they are better than me. And that's exactly what he is. He's one of those people. He, you know, he, he did. I don't think that I'm better than anybody, but I know nobody's better than me. And he, Gordon Gecko, he the ego that he has to him is that he clearly thinks that he's better than everybody. And I'm not that level of 
an egomaniac, but you know, I, I, I do want to set myself apart. That's what influenced me to think big and to, you know, formulate this plan to, to, to become bigger and better than I am. Um, another cold fucking line is, uh, is this other guy because you know when you watch this movie you, you find out that uh gordon gecko he is a multi multi-millionaire a bunch of times over right but he comes across this other guy that he's uh in conflict with his name is sir larry and um you know they're having this uh argument about a company that uh gecko has information inside information about that larry's trying to buy and uh you know larry knows that he's he's somehow infiltrated his organization to get this information and he ends up having this, he calls a meeting with gecko to try to you know have this showdown with him he says that there's going to be a showdown for this company that they're both bidding for so right he says uh i could break you in two pieces over my knee he says you know it i know it i could buy you six times over and then he gets real medieval he says i could dump the start just to burn your ass and he has this, uh, he's like English or something like that. So that's why <laughs> I had that uh, accent to me. So, you know, just that one. I was like, man, the game that these cats play on that big of a level. Um, I fucking, you know, I love it. There's something about it. I love it. He, you know, they talk about the game between people. Uh, that that's all they're, that that's all that this, uh, that, that what they're doing is. It's a game between people and their, um, uh, their atmosphere, how, how high above they are than normal people, you know, these millionaires, and, uh, you know, that's another reason, you know, all these, all these quotes, man, just influence me to want to think bigger, and, uh, you know, I, you know, I started getting this influence to think big, but I don't, I, you know, I didn't necessarily know, and I have a better idea and understanding of how to get it now, but at the time, when I was a teenager, in my late, my late teens, I didn't, I didn't know how I was going to do that, right, and I'll tell you some, uh, my first fucking plan, which is a stupid fucking plan, is it just shows you how young and, and uh, naive I, I was. Uh, my, my biggest plan, being from La Mesa, Texas, which, like I said in the first episode, is a fucking uh, population of less than 10,000 people, right? Uh, I wanted to be the biggest weed dealer that there was in La Mesa. So stupid, man. Because, um, like I said, La Mesa is a small town. It was hard to get weed uh, at the time. Even, even like... Because at the time we were smoking uh, Reggie. If you know what, if you smoke weed, if you come from that, you know what Reggie is. It's the dirt weed. And uh, we were smoking that when I was younger. And then, you know, eventually they got a hold of some dro, or what they call it Zaza these days. That fucking stupid term. Um, but chronic dro, uh, the loud. And uh, it was it was harder to get in La Mesa. So, you know, I wanted to be that guy. I wanted to be able to have the connections. I wanted to be able to bring it in. I wanted to be able to sell it. I wanted to make the money off of it. And I wanted to be big in that way. And, uh, you know, come to the realization and I had been to, to juvenile, to juvenile, um, at 16 and later on the county jail there in La Mesa, um, for nothing big. Uh, but you know, the, the longest I've been in jail for was like a month and a half maybe. And even in that time, you find out that you don't really like jail, bro. Like, there are some cats that are stupid. They go to jail, and they don't mind being in jail, and they'll go to jail again and again and again for whatever fucking stupid reason. But I found out early on that that's not what I wanted. A jail was not the place for me. The food, uh, everything being, your freedom's being taken away from you. You're in this fucking, uh, we were in tanks uh, in county jail. In juvenile, it was a cell. Uh, in, in, um, in county jail it was it was a tank and it was a tank and you had i think it was like eight to twelve other people in the same tank as you so a lot of these people were fucking just jackasses bro they had no problem being in jail and they just they were as stupid as they were on the outside they were stupid on the inside and i'm not gonna lie i will admit i was i did some dumb things in county jail too man i won't get into those details maybe you know we'll visit this uh story again some other time but um also, another thing about jail was, you know, watching the movies about jail, like uh, American Me uh, and Blood In, Blood Out. You see these motherfuckers getting stabbed in jail, bro. And I, oh, God, I just could not, I just don't think I could live, <laughs> obviously. I don't think I could live with being stabbed uh, if you die. Obviously, you can't live. But I just don't like the idea of fucking being stabbed. So I definitely, that definitely steered me away, those two things. Um 
you know, your freedoms being taken away and then being stabbed. Those And wasting time, too. Being in there, like, time fucking goes by slow in there. We didn't have no windows in the tank. We used to have a TV that we all used to share. And the only way we knew what time it was on the outside was by watching this, uh, chant, this guide channel, TV guide channel. And it had the fucking, uh, the, the, the daytime sky on it. You know, while the channels, the guide was going, scrolling through, uh, it had the sky in the background. And I, it, it did have the time, too. But that's the only way we knew what time it was on the outside. And then come nighttime, it would show, like, the nighttime sky and shit like that. So it was fucking very, uh, it was a mind fuck not knowing what time it was and seeing how slow time passed when you're in there doing nothing, literally. Because you can't do nothing in jail, obviously. Um, so those things fucked me off from... You know, it, it steered me away from my first plan, being a weed dealer, right? Boom. So my second plan, and I ended up getting influenced by watching UFC in the early days. Uh, I still watch it to this day. I'm a big fan of martial arts and boxing. Uh, but I, you know, I, I wanted to be um, a mixed martial artist, uh, and then I wanted to be a boxer as well. Um, my earliest influences when I was watching UFC, like I said back in the early, early days, was Chuck Liddell, man. He was the biggest fucking thing coming out of UFC. Uh, you know, he was a knockout artist. He was a good fucking wrestler. He was he was knocking everybody out, man. And uh, the best fight that I ever saw was uh, Chuck Liddell versus Vanderlei Silva, which is how I got introduced to Pride, which Pride is the old school um, version of UFC, but it's from Japan. Um, he came from that organization. He was the biggest name over there. He comes to the UFC to fight the biggest name in the UFC, and it was a clash, bro. Like, it was a great fight back and forth, and the Iceman wins. And, uh, you know, that was my early uh, influence in, in mixed martial arts. Uh, not necessarily just fucking being in a, in a fight throwing hands, but being able to wrestle somebody and, and strangle somebody, which um, my, comes to my next point, which is my next influence was the Diaz brothers, Nick and Nate Diaz. And the first one was Nick because uh, he comes from the Pride days as well. And, you know, he submits one of the top guys. He has a fucking banger fight uh, with Takanori Gomi back in the day in Pride um, where he uh, it's a slugfest at first. And then the motherfucker takes him down and does like a really rare submission, a go-go plata on uh, Takanori Gomi and finishes him and just puts him on the map as one of the best of the best um, in the world, uh, period. Uh, so, you know, those th that became my, my next plan was to, to become a, a, you know, mixed martial artist, a mixed martial artist and, and make it on a higher, and make it, on, make it to a high level and make a name for myself and the notoriety and make the money that comes along with it. Uh, that was my second plan, but in, mind you, like I said, this is all in my my late. Well, this is all in high school, um, where I where I become influenced by this. Oh, excuse me. And uh, you know, high school life. If you remember what high school was like, uh, you know, you get introduced to you know girls and fucking partying and and stuff like that. Sport, other sports. Uh, I was no I was no different. You know, I I I started dating this girl in high school, man, and. Uh, Sure enough, I just wanted to do nothing but, you know, date this girl and be her boyfriend and do all that puppy love type shit. And uh, I just got carried away in that. And, any, every, any, you know, eventually heartbreak and breaking hearts and stuff like that. So that kind of fucking deterred me from, you know, pursuing the mixed martial arts. And then, you know, that being in my early days and then fast forward to my adult days, I, I, I tried taking it up again while I was working and you know while after I had started having a family and then I, while I was working to support my family I tried to get back into boxing and then I developed a fucking uh, hernia uh, and that you know I, I also had this fear of surgery uh, I had this fear of sur I, I don't think I necessarily have it now because I've been through it and I know what it what it is and it's it, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be but nonetheless uh, there, there are some complications that can occur with surgery so that fear of surgery uh, you know, being able and, and 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 you know that being out of work and not being able to provide for your family when you're not set up properly to take care of them. If you happen to be taken out of work, like I, I was for a couple of months with this hernia, when I had surgery in the recovery process. So, you know, those those two things kind of deterred me away from pursuing a life in combat sports early on, and you know now in my adult days. So. You know, I, those are my two plans, and they didn't come to fruition for those reasons. And you know, I had to figure out another way to to get it. You know, to to make my to make my um, my dreams of uh, becoming a, becoming big time. Uh, in, in other in 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 other words, um, 
how to get it. So fast forward to when I became 25 years old, I'm still smoking weed. I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do, how I'm going to do what I'm setting out to do. Um, you know, I, I, I try to find direction. Uh, I, I discovered uh, Joe Rogan, right? And I started listening to Joe Rogan in the early days when he started podcasting and even to this day, not so much today. Uh, I've gotten into other uh, sources of information and knowledge and stuff like that. I try, I try to um, find different sources and I have. So, you know, I started off early listening to Joe Rogan in his psychedelic days and his early weed smoking days. And he's talking about um, he's talking about life and and finding your way and he says that you know whatever that whatever it is that you want to do if somebody else is already doing it that means you can do it too so you know that kind of also reinforced it in my mind that anything is possible you know if you're willing to put in the work and um you know his his, his example is that you know he he wanted to become a comedian and you know he would see you know some of his heroes and his idols and influences that they were successful in comedy um, even starting out, you never think that in the early days that you could make it big. I mean, maybe, you know, some people do, they believe in themselves that much, but, uh, you know, there is always that doubt, but he, he stuck with it because that was his dream. And eventually now he's one of the biggest comedians and podcasters in the world. So it reinforced in my mind that if, like he said, if somebody else is doing it, you can do it too. Right. That's also, you know, that's a big part of why I gravitated towards him. And then, you know, Fast forward, he, and through the evolu- evolu- evolution of Joe Rogan, he starts having on other people um, that uh, are knowledgeable in you know various subjects and stuff like that. And he comes, he he ends up uh, interviewing this guy named Jordan Peterson, uh, which is a huge part of um, how, you know why I, I developed this uh, plan uh, for my life. I, I I why I started developing this plan is. He's a clinical psychologist. Uh, he was a professor in Canada, and then he, he comes on Joe Rogan, and he, he explains that um, uh, he has this program. It's called self-authoring, and that he says that you know there's um, studies that show that if you map out a plan for your life, uh, your strengths and your weaknesses, your visions, your goals, and then uh, if you map it out, that the more likely you are to achieve uh, what it is you're setting out to do. And then he, he starts, so there's, you know, the authoring, the, the future self, your future self, and then there's your, uh, he has a, a past authoring program, and then he has a present authoring program. So you can figure out exactly who, you know, you can go back through the past and find out what shaped you at an early age, what what it is now that are your strengths and your weaknesses, and how you can um, use those as a combination of becoming who you want to be in the future, which is the self-authoring program in a, in a whole, Right. But you can come up with a plan for your life, and you're more likely to achieve that plan if you have an actual plan, right? So that's when I started brainstorming this plan. I started, you know, I, I, I ended up coming out of, like, the small-time jobs that I was doing in restaurants and um, stuff like that. I, that's all it was that I was. I was working at McDonald's, fucking Pizza Hut, movie theaters, uh, back to McDonald's, um, I don't even remember what the fuck else I was in the early days, but I, I remember those for the most part, right? And then, you know, I got out of doing jobs like that, and I ended up getting into this job at a warehouse, right? And it was when I, it was uh, when my wife became pregnant with our first. Uh, well, she has a son. He's my stepson. I've been with the, in his. They've been. We've been in our li- in each other's lives since he was um, a little over one years old, right? But when she became pregnant with my son, uh, that's when you know I, I doubled down and I got a better job, a job that was more. Um, uh, it was more steady, and the work was, it was, I find that it was more valuable to society than just working at fast food and shit like that. So I got a better job, I, I stuck with it, uh, I, I practiced being a hard worker, and I stuck with that job for over six years, right? And um, still smoking weed at the time, right? Still trying to figure out, fine-tune the plan, and uh, along comes the COVID pandemic. And... Um, if you remember during the COVID pandemic, they gave away, I think it was like two or three stimulus checks, right? And um, that's when I decided to really get back into my first influence, my Gordon Gecko shit uh, of investing, you know, the whole Wall Street trip that I, that I wanted to get on. And I was like, you know, let's let's put some money into an account and, and start investing, learn what we can about investing, get into that, see what we can make it do. And I was confident in myself enough that I put up the money for it from my stimulus checks 
and I turned at the time I turned three hundred and fifty dollars total uh, into over four thousand, right? Being a, a, a beginner, a, a hardcore beginner, right? And uh, at, while I'm doing that, you know, I'm still in my search for knowledge, trying to find out, you know, more stuff about what I can that's conducive to moving my plan along. So um, along the lines, I, I discovered um, Patrick Bet David, uh, who's another, and he still is. I still follow his content to this day. Uh, he was a big part of of uh, why I call myself Jamie the Conqueror, uh, and it goes into his backstory, and then what he you know calls recreating yourself, uh, and you know because his his backstory is that he he's from Iran, his parents and him him and his parents they come from Iran when he was young, and he comes to the states and he works literally from being in a war torn country, coming to America with nothing, no education. Uh, he didn't go to college, but, you know, he finished high school and stuff like that, but he, you know, he comes from nothing, coming to a foreign country, which is America, which is where he lives now, and he's all about America now, he's from Iran, but he comes from America, and he takes all the, he uses all the opportunities available to, available to him here, being from nothing, and he turns himself into a, a multi, multi-millionaire, hundreds of millions of dollars he's worth, right, so it just, it's, it's an inspiration to know that people come from other fucking places, with nothing, and they become everything, you know, and more. So, you know, I, you know, going back to the recreating yourself, that's how I come up with this um, identity of Jamie the Conqueror, right? And it, you know, it goes back to the self-authoring as well. So, I, I, um, I start taking life more serious. I start working harder, um, and you know, I start building a better reputation for myself. Which also he goes into. It, 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 you know, he he used to be a he, he went to the army because he couldn't he didn't make it. Um, uh, selling gym memberships early on during the day, he goes into the army to start making more money. And uh, throughout the army, you know, he's a he's a partier, he's a playboy type person. Um, you know, just getting drunk all the time. Not all the time, but you you know, they have competitions. He would say about who could drink the most bottles, the most shots, the most beers. Just living that type of lifestyle, right? To becoming uh, after he comes out of the, the um, army to getting into financial services and starting his own company and then another company and then another company. Right, just uh, sells his company for hundreds of millions of dollars and becomes a successful fucking entrepreneur. Very, very fucking good story uh, that he has. Right, so if you could recreate yourself from being this person that everybody considers like a slacker or somebody who doesn't work hard, who's not going to aspire to very much, to becoming one of the most successful entrepreneurs uh, in America to date, it just reinforced that you can recreate yourself. You can build a better reputation from how people know used to know you. Uh, to how you want them to know you is by doing the things you say that you're going to do and becoming that person. So I uh, come up with this identity of Jamie the Conqueror and it's, um, you know, it's, 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 what it is is it's a culmination of who I used to be, uh, you know, the troublemaker, the hoodlum, um, this directionless uh, young adult to uh, becoming a uh, you know, a novice entrepreneur, uh, a novice investor, and, you know, the things that I accomplished in those things, you know, turning a little bit of money into a little bit more money uh, from going from hundreds of dollars to thousands of dollars, right? And not never having any experience doing it. Uh, stop being in trouble, getting in trouble, getting my own place from an apartment to a duplex to a house now. Like, I've taken a lot of steps from the person that I used to be to becoming the person that I am now. And um, it's about who I'm working on becoming uh, in the future, which is why um, my next uh, influence, his name is uh, Alex Hormozzi. And he's another guy who's from, uh, his parents are from Iran, and he, he settled here in America, in Baltimore, he goes to college, becomes a leading member of his class, uh, becomes his own entrepreneur, he goes through his own entrepreneur junior journey, and uh, also becomes just this... Um, millionaire successful millionaire entrepreneur right and he talks about you know um um you know just a work ethic and and acquiring skills skill stacking and becoming valuable in you know the positions that you're in making yourself more valuable uh so that you know you, you set yourself apart more so than the people uh, also doing the same thing which he goes into like the generation today how a lot of people don't have they, they don't work hard anymore everybody is a complainer uh, nobody wants to work hard nobody wants to stick with the hard work and you know it, it's 
that message about work ethic and, and learning and practicing that um, I take to heart because that's what I do now in the position that I'm in. Um, you know, I take my job where I'm at more seriously than the other people around me that I've able, I was able to work my way up from $9.50 all the way up to $15.50. Now, it doesn't sound like a whole lot, but, you know, my checks are pretty good, uh, including tips. And that, you know, this is the first job that I, I've ever gotten promotion uh, to, to Red Hat, which is just basically a trainer, uh, training position. I train, in, I train new hires to do exactly what I do, right? So um, shout out to Ivan for, for giving me that um, promotion. He'll probably never hear this, but uh, in the event that he does, shout out to him for, you know, believing, me, believing in me enough to give me the Red Hat position so that I could train people to hopefully be... Um, as good as me, if not better than me, I, you know, he, he saw enough in me to, to give me that, to give me that opportunity. So shout out to Ivan. And, uh, like I said, it, it's, you know, I, th- you know, all these influences that I have taking all that information and fine tuning the plan that I, f- I see for my life. Um, that's exactly what, what I, why I call myself Jamie the Conqueror, who I used to be, who I am, who I'm working to become, and um, the difference between me and, and everybody else around me is that I, I'm not complacent. Like, I, I stay on the gas. I still work hard. Uh, I don't stop working on my self-improvement. And uh, my work ethic in general is also what, you know, sets me apart. So, um, you know, skill stacking, work ethic, self-improvement, all these things are what I'm going to continue to use to further myself along this plan that I call Jamie the Conqueror. And... Um, you know, some of the other things that I won't say that are in my plan until they come to fruition, uh, it, you know, like I said, it's just a general idea of why I call myself uh, Jamie the Conqueror. Uh, if you see me on social media or my YouTube or anything like that, that's that's what it is. It's just who I used to be, who I am, who I'm going to, who I'm working to become. And, um, you know, another, another big, um, you know, bit of uh, a quote that I live by from Patrick B. David is that, uh, in order to get ahead, you got to outwork, out improve, and outlast um, everybody. And in in the job that I'm in right now, that's exactly what I've done. You know, in half the time that I've been here, as opposed to people who have been at this place, this company that I'm with uh, since it opened, I've been there half the time, and I make uh, the same, if not more, money than than they do because I've done that. I've outworked them, I've out improved them, and uh, I've outlasted many, a lot of a lot of them. Uh, there's very few people that are there from the beginning that are still there, and it's. Uh, you know, I think that's a true testament to who I have become thus far and like I said who I'm going to continue to work on becoming because you know I'm trying to work my way up there now that I've gotten a promotion and then I've gotten a CDL because I you know I want to increase my earnings even more because you know more money helps my plan further along and then it helps me uh, you know with my family as well you know what I'm saying I want to be able to provide uh, even better quality of life for my family and um, I feel like a CDL and working my way up in this company working my way up in this company is my plan A, uh, but my plan B is my CDL. So if I can get a job in the CDL and, and, and make more money uh, with that, then I will, and then I'll continue to work my way up in whatever company or organization decides to hire me for my CDL type work. Um, but right now I'm doing that in the company, the service industry that I'm in right now. So uh, my plan A, my plan B is to become more valuable and hopefully one day manage something because I find that uh, managers uh, in various industries, uh, depending how uh, important they are to society, they make the most money. Uh, you know, like the people on the Forbes fucking list, the richest list. Um, you know, a lot of these people manage money. They manage companies. And they manage. You know, they do a combination of both. Uh, so I just want to become more valuable in those terms, so that I can manage somebody's actual business someday. And you know take it to the next level, take myself to the next level as well as take them to the next level and then we all make this fucking circle go round and round, you know what I'm saying, I, you know, I can make this money, I can, you know, become ultimately the conqueror that I want to be. Now, uh, ever since I had my, and I, I did mention earlier that I, I developed a hernia, but once I had this new, uh, once I had my hernia surgery, um, I've kind of developed this other, you know, I tried to work on my skills even more and practice the skills that I've learned thus far at my job. You know, I I, I look at it as like this newer version of me uh, now that I have a newer body because that hernia wasn't nothing to play with. That shit was fucking nasty looking. It was was terrible. And uh, once I got that fixed, now that I'm, you know, I feel like I'm as good as new. uh, I'm working on like my people skills. 
uh, how I manage uh, people that I train. Uh, I'm trying to work on those skills and, you know, trying to, you know, uh, leverage my work ethic, uh, which is another thing that Alex Hormozzi talks about is leveraging your output. Um, I'm trying to work on all those things as a whole now that I've had this hernia surgery. So um, that's that's really all it down, boils down to now is, is, is just now that I have my plan, I fine-tuned it, I finalized it, now I'm doing the work, I'm continuing my self-improvement, and I, you know, I'm working towards ultimately my bigger goals. So that's what Jamie the Conqueror is. Um, long story short, which is still a long story, but it could, it was longer, I'm telling you. The, the way that I wrote this episode down, my my format, my outline for this episode was, was a lot longer than what I, you know, just went over with, with you. So um, I just want to leave you with some quotes that I, I that helped me um, with my self-improvement, with my work ethic, with, with sticking with my goals and the work hard uh, attitude that I have to further myself along, I just want to share some of those with you. So maybe that you can find some uh, inspiration in them or, or, you know, take them and, and, and use them in your life. So uh, the biggest one is, is uh, was a, a, an ancient Japanese swordsman uh, from a long fucking time ago. His name was Miyamoto Musashi. And uh, the quote that I take away from him is, uh, today is victory over yourself of yesterday. Tomorrow is victory over lesser men. And uh, it's about self-improvement and always uh, seeking to improve yourself and your skills, right? Set yourself apart. Be the best uh, that you can be. Quote number one. Quote number two is um, comes from somebody you may know. Uh, if you follow mixed martial arts in the UFC, his name is Dana White. Uh, he talks about um, today's, uh, the work ethic in today's uh, culture, Um uh, he says there's never been more opportunity than there is right now uh, that this next generation is such a group of pussies uh, for the small group of savages out there to run these uh, pussies over these kids uh, anybody else that's developed uh, this victim mentality this victim mindset um, set yourself apart and blow these kids out of the water and get ahead right uh, work hard uh, uh, also the one that I went over from Patrick Big David was to outwork out improve and outlast uh, your competition uh, that's a good one, uh, and I live by that every day, right? It keeps me going. Uh, outwork, out improve, outlast, and then uh, last but not least uh, is um, Alex Hormozzi, and he talks about um, as it pertains to hard work. He says, "The more I think about it as a competitive landscape, I'm clear on what this path is supposed to look like. I get happier about the harder it is because I know that no one else will follow." And it flips from this poor me mindset to this poor everyone else who has to fucking try uh because you know if today if you look at today's society it's just evident that nobody wants to work hard anymore and if you work hard and you constantly improve that you will uh set yourself apart from everybody else right right so you know take those use those any way that you can uh maybe it'll help you better understand me if you come across me uh in 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 society um Maybe you get a better understanding of who I am. So, let's see. Um, now that we've got you know this introduction to who I am, what I am, what I'm trying to become, uh, let's go ahead and transition to some lighter topics, right? And um, let's talk about um, you know what I you know I had a couple of topics, but let's just get into something a little bit more lighter. Uh, and the topic that I chose is uh, the vaping culture in today's. Um, today's society man motherfuckers went from smoking cigarettes to smoking vapes uh and i'm talking about the nicotine vapes and even more so like you know people are, are vaping concentrates the uh, weed concentrates on a on a on a higher frequency on more frequently than they used to it used to just be smoking you know flour and now they're doing vapes all the time and now at where i work especially because it's it's a lot of younger people than i am like 10 years younger than i am they're smoking nicotine vapes and then they'll switch to uh, a weed vape and then they'll fucking hit the motherfuckers at the same time and it's just very fucking weird man that at a young age you could be so addicted to vapes like I always hear people talking about can I hit your vape do you have a vape that I can hit uh, I'll give it back to you if I can use it can I hold on to it for a little bit let me hit your vape this let me hit your vape that what flavor and this and this and that what type of vape do you have like it's so weird man to see young kids hooked on these vapes it's so weird um it used to, like I said, it used to be cigarettes, and I, I don't know about back in the day. I guess maybe I, I could speak on it a little bit, but even back in the day, like, I used to smoke cigarettes when I was a teenager and into my young 20s. 
um, I tried smoking cigarettes and I was smoking cigarettes, but it never like really caught on and became a habit like uh, a lot of people did. Um, you know, how cancer became, you know, a big leading cause of death due to smoking cigarettes. Uh, that became, a th that was a big thing for a while and then it kind of, you know, went away for a little bit. And, you know, what's developed because of that is nicotine vapes. Uh, they're supposed to be less harmful than, than cigarettes or whatever, but it doesn't look like it, man. Everybody's sucking on a vape these days, man. Everybody's, uh, you know, I walk through so many clouds of smoke because of vapes and vapors, people who vape. Uh, it's it's crazy, man, the number of vapes you see. I don't know, maybe even vapes outweigh the number of cigarettes sold, or it will surpass that number eventually, uh, probably in a shorter span of time, the way I see these people sucking on vapes. Um, everybody's got a fucking vape everywhere you look. They got those big-ass handheld you know, they look like silencers for guns, big ass, thick ass, uh, you know, they call them batteries, I guess, uh, you know, the vapors, the vapes, and, uh, sucking on them bitches and blowing big ass clouds of smoke for what? Like, what the fuck? I don't understand. I don't know if it's just for show or if they really enjoy the nicotine or if it's a combination of both, but it's, it's fucking weird. I find it weird. That's my opinion. I'm sorry. I'm strong in my opinions and I don't give a fuck what you think. But that is my opinion. Everybody's got to vape. Everybody's fucking vaping these days. So that's, you know, that's my rant about vaping. Um, also, I, you know what, I, I will get into this. Like, I don't know if you guys have noticed, uh, it's my next topic, uh, the rounding up culture of these days, like at drive throughs and um, even anywhere you go to shop in store, like, would you like to round up to the nearest dollar uh, type shit? Uh, it's become more and more prevalent these days. I, I was reading uh, online that it started back in 2012, and it's become more prevalent over the years, and it's really had a hard comeback um, since COVID. Uh, people asking, you know, bi uh, businesses asking if you would like to round up and donate to charity. And um, I saw that the number is in uh, the hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, the amount of uh, money people have uh, donated because of these roundup causes, these initiatives. And, uh, and it, it makes sense, man, because if you think of how many people go through drive throughs every day, how many drive throughs you find yourself in, and then you know, multiply that by how many people there are in whatever big city um, and state you're in, um, a lot of money must get donated to these fucking places. And I think last year, no, the last year that it had a big stat for this website that I read was in 2022, and it said it was like, it was something like $749 million raised um, in rounding up initiatives uh, throughout the country um, it's very crazy right because sometimes and I think they said the minimum amount donated was like 37 cents or maybe it was 47 44 cents something like that but you know they it, it, and it used to be would you like to donate a dollar and I saw that it said the research shows that people are more inclined to donate money if you just ask them if they want to round up to the nearest dollar and not so not not more so as not not doing a dollar uh, not round, not donating, not donating a dollar. I can't even fucking speak today. Uh, but more people were inclined to donate change more so than a whole dollar, uh, which is crazy, right? But I guess it's not crazy because uh, you know, if you donate a whole dollar, that's a whole dollar. If you donate half of a dollar, it's, you still got the other half left. What are you gonna do with half of a fucking dollar? You might as well donate a whole dollar. But it found that that wasn't the case, so um, it became, would you like to round up to the nearest dollar? And I do it all the time. Um, I, I used to. I don't know. I had this weird. I, I had this weird thought about like, if I say no out of drive through, are they gonna fuck with my food? Because I said no, you know. By the time I get to the to the to the window to collect my food, are they gonna fuck with my food because I said no? And then I just it, and it sounds selfish too. But then I just said, you know, fuck it. Just we'll just start rounding to the nearest dollar. How much, you know, how bad could it fucking be? Uh, and not that it is a bad thing, because if this money is actually getting donated to, you know, good causes, then I, you know, it, it is what it is. Go ahead and, you know, take my, my change and, and donate it. Donate everybody's change to these good causes. But if you're a scumbag company corporation and you're pocketing some of these fucking profits, um, shame on you, you dick bag. You dick, you, you dirty dick bag douche. Uh, shame on you if that's what you're doing. If you're pocketing a por portion of the proceeds and then you are donating a smaller part of the proceeds because like I said $749 million is a lot of money so if you're pocketing $649 fucking million dollars and only donating $100 million of course that's a lot of money and it's more money than I'll ever donate in my lifetime but if you're asking people to donate their whole all their change 
you should donate a hundred percent of the money to whatever uh, charitable cause that there is that you're claiming to, to to donate to so that's my other rant for today rounding up at drive throughs it used to be because i was scared they were going to spit in my food if i said no and then it, i just became i just uh gave in and said yes donate my money to a charitable cause so that's my good deed anytime i go out to a drive through uh hopefully you do it too hopefully this money makes it where it says it's supposed to go so again that's my rant for vaping uh, the vaping culture, uh, the rounding up initiatives, and you know a, a brief but a long introduction to uh, Jamie the Conqueror. With that being said, um, it's nice to meet you. That's it for this week. And uh, again, I look forward to talking to you again next week here on Jamie's Day Off on the Jamie's Day Off podcast. Until then, have a great week. We'll talk to you again soon. Peace. 